At Rising, we've long understood that people are at the core of what you do. That's why we've been the go-to SAP partner for some of the best-run companies in the world. So when we hear companies question why it's so hard to manage their people, we say, it doesn't have to be. Thanks for joining our live stream today. We encourage you to leave questions and comments below and be a part of our live discussion. And now, let's welcome our panelists. Hello, and welcome to this important discussion today about how organizations are transforming the way they operate. Today, flexibility and agility have come to the forefront of everyone's minds. And with the impact of COVID, Application Managed Services, or AMS, is not about cost-cutting and not about outsourcing. Today, we're joined by some guests who will talk to us about how they've accomplished this task. We're joined with representatives from Jeldwin Windows and Doors, Hanna Metal Industrial Supply, Hubble Manufacturing, and Huntsworth Health and Communications. So let me turn it over to our guests to introduce themselves, their company, and where their companies are located, and what platforms they're running for HR. Hi, everyone. I'm Sue Murphy. I'm the Senior HIS Manager at Geldwin. We have around 25,000 employees in 25 countries, and um, for our AMS helps support our SuccessFactor suite, um, which includes um, EC, recruiting, compensation, onboarding, and talent and performance management. Good Hello. morning. This is Suchi Kumi. Uh, I'm from Hubble Incorporated, and uh, I'm the HR Technology Director for Hubble. We are a manufacturing company with about 20,000 employees spread across 15 countries, and we have been live at Flexus Factors for um, or three plus years since 2015. And we have implemented uh, pretty much the full suite of success factors, right from recruiting, onboarding, and compensation, variable pay, learning, and uh, you know the talent suite, uh, excluding the jam and workforce analytics modules. I'm glad to speak here today and share my experiences with you all. Thanks, Suchi. Andreas, do you want to go up next? Hello, this is Andreas Spoilein. I'm the HRIS manager for Kenna Metal. Uh, Kenna Metal is a, a global supplier for tools and technology to manufacturing uh, companies. We have about 9,000 employees in more than 40 countries globally, and we did roll out uh, SuccessFactor suite, the, the full suite, uh, starting 2016, uh, and we have implemented almost all modules uh, except payroll. Fantastic. Christian? Hi, I'm uh, a Christian rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, the HR systems admin for Huntsworth Health. Uh, Huntsworth Health is uh, an international healthcare and, and comms group made up of multiple uh, individual specialist agencies. Um, we primarily focus on uh, communication services for healthcare clients like pharmaceutical and, and biotech companies. Um, we are pretty near the beginning of our success factors journey. Um, the only module I'm aware of that we're not implementing going forward currently is recruiting. So we're full suite and we're, we're midway through. So you're all pretty busy. So <laughs> <laughs> the heroes of HR, we want to talk to you about how you knew application managed services was a solution that would benefit your organization. Can we kind of do a round table and talk about at which stage of your success factors HCM life cycle did you determine that you need a partner to help managing your solutions. You know, were, were you aware at the outset that you'd need help with this? Christian, do you want to start? Yeah, so I uh, have the benefit of, well, I suppose the benefit in the curse of not actually being there when that decision was made. Um, and so the company went with in the intention that none of us here at the time were experts in implementing HR systems. None of us knew which HR system we wanted. And so it was a, uh, a conscious decision to have someone like Rising on board from the get-go to really guide that and hold our hand through that process. Sushi, how about you? For us, I think it's a twofold um, aspect because uh, the first one being obviously the skill set because SuccessFactors has been a new system for Hubble when we implemented it. 
and having a having some technical expert is readily available as we go live with the new system and help us stabilize this new system has been critical for us. And rising, obviously, you know, it, it's it's well known uh, within the HCM market, and some of our team has already worked with rising, and uh, so that's how we have approached rising. The second being, you know. When it comes to our support structure, how it's laid out, we have front, uh, the first level support being handled by our HR operations and the second level support being structured to, to be handled by our HR technology team. So, uh, you know, having rising to provide our AMS services helps us to supplement uh, from a staffing perspective as well while providing, um, you know, on-demand services. So I think it's a twofold for us. Yeah, that's interesting. And we're going to talk about that supplemental thing a little bit later because I think that's important. Andreas, do you want to tell us um, how you decided that you needed AMS services? So I was also in the position that I did not have to decide. But so when we went live with SuccessFactor, we did the so-called Big Bang. So we did replace an HCM SAP system with the SuccessFactor suite. And as we had no expertise or knowledge in-house on success factor technology. We needed definitely a partner and we have chosen uh, Rising to be the implementation partner and the support partner. So it's it was the first intention was really knowledge transfer so that the internal team gets trained with like the implementation and then uh, as a like second or third level support type of uh, service. Uh, just to basically uh, support the internal team uh, on on managing the, the the system, but also enhance and do further implementations, like module by module. Okay. Sue, yeah. last yeah, but not it, least. <laughs> I think it was uh, similar for us if, um, to what uh, Suchi's experience was. We had pieces of success factors in place. And last year we went live with um, EC and recruiting. And just from previous experience, the team knew we needed some sort of support beyond just our in-house um, team. And that outside expertise just brought more value to the organization. It does. So and one of the things I want to hone in on is exactly what outsourcing services that you're using, because I think when in HR we talk about outsourcing, I think the first thing that typically comes to mind for those of us who have been around for a while is we're outsourcing payroll administration. But I don't think that's the case with any of you. So um, could we talk about what services you're really using with Rising? Yeah, I can start. Um, so it's a supplement of our team, really. Like we have our HR technology team um, that we use. And similar to Suchi, we have an HR team that does the initial troubleshooting. Um, most of the time, you know, if, after you're set up, if it's related to data, they're involved. Um, and then our HR technology team is that second tier. Um, and they're, they're really that line of defense that they're doing that deep dive troubleshooting, what's needed. Some things we're able to do in-house ourselves, but when you go out, um, you're outsourcing that next tier of support, things that we can't handle in-house or thing that, things that require more detailed troubleshooting. Um, and really, it's a partnership that we're using um, in order to enhance our team and, and to transfer knowledge to our team as well. Sounds a little bit different from what um, you might expect a typical outsourcing or AMS service to be, if you don't know really what it entails. Um, Christian, can we turn over to you and you can talk about what services you're using AMS for? Yeah, I mean, it's quite uh, quite similar story, really. We are using it for, yeah, we're primarily using AMS for troubleshooting things that are sort of beyond our skill set. Um, I'm quite I'm quite stubborn in how I work. In that, if there's something wrong with success factors, I want to figure it out, um, but I can't always figure it out. And so there are a lot of times I have to come to Rising and, and ask for that knowledge. And so knowledge transfer has been a huge part of my experience with Rising. Um, and prior to Huntsworth Health, I worked for a company called Dufree, which is also a Rising uh, customer. And Prior to joining DoFree in 2018, I'd never used success factors before. And within about a month of joining DoFree, I was project managing compensation implementation. <laughs> real, real deep end. Um, and 
the entire so my entire knowledge on success letters comes from rising knowledge transfer um it's the only reason i'm here really <laughs> um, just having con- consultants teaching me and and holding me through it until i could finally do it myself without having to uh, to be there all the time so yeah and uh, in terms of day to day i'm the only member of the core hr systems team um we're still growing um so rising sort of plays the analogy i kind of use is in, in the uk in soccer or football um the audience is seen as the 12th man it's the extra person for the bitch and that's kind of how i see rising it's the additional person to our team that is much much larger than our entire team combined and has infinite resources for us to to lean upon so yeah that's kind of how i see it and it's very much a a hand holding knowledge transfer and hey give us some advice because we've never done this before and what's the best use what do your other companies do how yeah basically we're as open we want to be as as free-flowing with our implementations as possible and trying to be as modern as possible and so being able to rely on rising's wealth of experience from other customers is also yeah so useful i i love that because that was the one thing you know in doing sap myself as a customer years ago we were always so what do other customers do so yeah. you have a ready resource to do that <laughs> i'm all, i also wrote down 12th man because i think that i think we're going to use that <laughs> Suchi, how about you? Um, for our situation, rising pretty much you can kind of look at it as a third level support because the first level being HR operations um, who handle the process queries and data queries, whereas HR technology team is responsible for all the system administration efforts, which is my team. Mm-hmm. So any configuration implementation efforts are managed by my team and um, as shared earlier, obviously we do rely heavily on rising in terms of improving our success factors, employee experience, and the kind of services we've been using rising for is, you know, pretty much spans across the entire success factor suite, right from you know hire to retire processes, and uh, I would say the that relationship has been evolving in the sense that you know we initially started to take rising services from a configuration standpoint. We started doing projects with rising and we have taken their help with implementing some integrations in terms of you know, using intelligent services. So uh, what I like about this relationship is you know, when you have a problem and you, when you reach out, you don't really have to confine yourself within the uh, type of what we have been doing before. But when you reach out with a problem, you know, I, I get to hear a, few options. These are all the different ways you can solve. And, uh, you know, and we are connected with different experts within that space uh, to resolve the issue. So th- that's the best part about this relationship. Very interesting. It, it sounds like so far from what I'm hearing is that the relationship is kind of flexible to, to your needs. Um, and Andreas, have we anything to add to that? And Sue? Yeah, I mean, I can I can say uh, so rising is uh, like an enhancement to our team. So they they step in when the team is at the end of knowledge or also resources. So it's not just troubleshooting what they do for us. It's also in some cases kind of business consulting as we ask a lot for best practice or standard across industries. So because Kenna Metal tends to do very complex things uh, or easy things, but uh, very complex. So it's always good to have like a third party to uh, oversees that and looks uh, on it, makes it sense uh, what we try to achieve, or is there a much better approach, uh, like with a different solution? And and as to add to add to the flexibility, uh, I can also say that uh, the rising team is very flexible, so we can reach out to them at any point of time, and it's not. There are not uh, like that hard criteria you need to fulfill to be able to even submit a ticket or something compared to SAP, for example. So it's much more flexible and collaborative, I would say. And, and we did not pay you to say that. Not yet. Not <laughs> yet. Sue, do you have anything to build on that? <laughs> yeah, I think I think the same thing that everyone's saying. It's like that best practice piece. Like you have your team, your internal team that knows 
what they know, but rising, you may have your point of contact for say employee central, but there's a whole nother team that sits behind them that they can use from a collaboration ex, um, expectation too, so that they can say like, what have you seen in other things you've worked on? So um, there's a whole network behind um, behind that one person and um, with different experiences. So. so when you engage, how does that work um, with the rising as an AMS supplier? Is it is it like a level one, two, three that you go through to, to get help? How do you do that? But you mean like when we're contacting Ryzen? Yeah. Yeah. Do, is, you know, you know how you, you know, yeah. you get into a phone call and, you know, you have to press one for this and two yeah. for that, or, you know, do you work your way through a level of seniority yeah. and expertise or how, how do you automated engage? tone and you have to press <laughs> buttons and no, right. it's not. No, I think that my team is pretty good about like putting the tickets in through the ticketing system, but also documenting what they've done so far to try and troubleshoot it. So it's not like a repeat. And then it's, getting on the phone and working together to say, what, where are we? What have we done already? What do they need to do? And, and working through the problem together. So I, I truly see it as a partnership between the, the two. And I'm, I'm going to take this one step further. It's some, not something we talked about, but um, at that point, let's say SAP has to get involved because there's something wrong with the system. Um, is, does Rising remain engaged in that effort too, or does that go back to, to your team? For us, they do, yeah. No, and same here, like at Canny Metal, they submit tickets in cases where it makes sense. Like when, for example, questions come back or we expect questions coming back with very technical details when a uh, rising team is, is filing tickets. But on the other hand, it's also my team is also filing tickets. So they decide, do they go directly to SAP or do they go to rising first? And in our case, I think that the same thing applies. There have been situations where rising um, consultants have been part of our calls with SAP uh, support and where together they have uh, come up with a solution for us. And I think that kind of partnership is very much appreciated. And our rising account executive is in touch with our SAP account executive to make sure from a product perspective, there is good partnership. And um, I, I think there is a very positive partnership uh, in, in that side of the house for us, where, uh, where our SAP account is very clear that, you know, what kind of service Rising is providing for us in terms of our experience and, uh, you know, with success factors and also improving by implementing new enhancements and projects. Whereas from a product's perspective, the SAP team does provide all the required partnership. So that, that's, that was a very good thing. Yeah, I like that model where SAP becomes part of it and Rising remains engaged. It keeps the con continuity of information flowing, I would think. Mm -hmm. okay. Kristen, did you have any anything to add to that? I mean, it's pretty much a similar situation here. Uh, we don't have our own account management or, or executive at SAP, um, but we still have this very natural understanding of when Rising raises that SAP ticket or when we do. And it tends to be, hey, if we're working on a contracted um, implementation and a consultant has found an issue, the consultant raises the ticket. It's I found an issue and the consultant isn't able to solve it because it only can be solved by SAP, then I raise the ticket. And it's just sort of a, a very natural understanding without having to question who should be doing what. It's, it's just done. It just makes sense. Sounds like Rising is really an extension of your team, just another person sitting in the corner there uh, working with you. Yeah, and yeah SAP. very much so. Um, so what made a difference with your AMS? Um, and some of you may have different experiences with AMS in the past and with managing the systems in-house, but, you know, let's go around the table and talk about what really, how does AMS help you with managing flexibility and predictability? What What's the biggest benefit? What makes a difference to you? Who wants to start? I can start. So uh, I think the the big uh, thing is the flexibility so it's really the enhancement of the team so they are part of the support team so if let's say a person leaves uh, our team for uh, like other opportunities outside then we can ex extend or uh, increase the usage of you of rising but if we are full staffed and we don't have big implementation projects or, or issues then 
it would just we would just consume less uh, services from from rising, but it's there is no like paperwork to be done. We can just consume as we need support. I would say. Okay, so you have kind of a, a set number of hours negotiated, and you use those as you want. Yes, so it's a, a, a fixed number of hours, and of course the services are uh, described in in a statement of work. What is uh, rising responsible for? Because we utilize it also for, for example, monitoring integrations and system processes, and this is all done also through that contract. Uh, but it's very flexible, as said. Christian, how about you? Yeah, I was going to say we have a similar setup to that in that. We have some third-party applications that aren't success factors that we integrate. So um, Equifax is one and Benefit Focus. But as the client, we're sort of trapped. When I say trapped, <laughs> tra <laughs> not in a negative way. <laughs> we're sort of stuck between not being the service provider for the third-party app and also not being the knowledge for the integration to success factors and so somehow being in that middle role. And so rising manages their side of that integration the third party company right manages their side and is just a very seamless uh sort of swinging motion between us and and each side being able to uh being able to pass on hey benefit focus needs to update this and we can't do it in house can ams help us um and even things like uh so like i said i'm I, I'm pretty stubborn with with doing things myself so i think you guys get a great deal out of our hours because we barely raise <laughs> anything um so it's a lot of the times it's things like hey somebody has just come to me and said that the entire time off calculation is wrong for this entire country and this is going to take me weeks to fix but i'm also doing this project hey rising can you investigate and solve that with my guidance on what those rules should be while i work on this and so having that back up constantly and ne and knowing that you're never going to be fully swamped is something I really, really value because yeah, it's very easy to end up being swamped with a, a huge HR system like success factors if you aren't ahead of the curve on it. Um, so yeah, having that sort of safety net of AMS is, is so useful. It's like a genie in your pocket. <laughs> Can be. Yeah. <laughs> Sue, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, how do you know AMS is making a difference to you? And actually, are any of you measuring results? Um, we look at the, um, you know, we have quarterly reviews with what we're using the AMS for. So with our given modules, and one of my questions is always like, what, what can we do differently on our team? Um, mm -hmm. Or where can education be stronger on our team to be able to do more in-house? I think um, this first, you know, we've been live with, um, EC and recruiting globally for one year now. Um, and you can already see the change in that. So, so during, you know, after hypercare was over from implementation, you see a large chunk of hours being used in that time. And it was a lot of stuff coming in, right? The change period, um, the team getting up to speed and, and, and knowing, um, being able to troubleshoot all the different things coming in. Um, and then you start to see it like leveling out and then understanding where those are coming in um, and how we're how we're bettering the education internally. Um, the other thing with the AMS that from a flexibility perspective is if there is an issue, because we all know relationships aren't perfect, right? Like if there is an issue, it, I do feel like it's a partnership where we're saying, what, what is the issue and how do we both solve this issue together to make it better, right? Um, it's not just about rising screwed up or Jeldwin screwed up, like how do we come together and not do this again in the future, right? Right. Yeah, communication can be mm -hmm. a problem at times, and sometimes we're not all saying the same thing the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's good to be able to have that relationship where you feel you can go back and, and yep. hash it out together. Um, it, there was a question that came in, in the chat, and it's kind of related to this. So I want to like throw it out there to you. How do you manage the success factors release pro process? Does that happen with Rising Engaged? Uh, yeah, this. this... <laughs> So go on. This is a, that's a good uh, a good point because Rising is preparing the release notes pretty good and they do it really based on our implementation, like what services or modules we are using. So they point out, okay, that's 
for interest for you or that can be critical there you have to do something and this is even more um, important since uh, sap changed their how they prepare releases because you don't get like that release notes anymore you have to submit questions and then there is a meeting where you can go through that questions but they do not basically provide you all information just on scratch what uh, what will change so and i think that's a very very uh, helpful service from rising to have that like customized release notes prepared yeah that is huge having done releases in the past i'm um, having someone that reviews all those notes and knows what it's going to impact in your system that's very tricky um how about the rest of you christian suchi sue yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm kind of a bit sad in that I actually look forward to the the release swings, <laughs> just for the vague hope that something may be coming down the pipeline that we really need from SAP. Um, so yeah, I, like, uh, like I've said, it's so useful having that meeting already be customized to exactly how we've set our system up. So because we didn't follow the trend and we decided to do compensation differently, suddenly this setting can be affected by this new release and rising knowing our setup intimately and us having these conversations with the same consultants that are working on our system to come in and say hey remember this thing we did for you back in this project this is going to be affected by this upcoming change and so having that intimate knowledge of of how we've set things up how it's going to be affected by future releases um, is really useful and sometimes we use that as decision making points for implementing things is okay this field is subject to change in future do you really want to rely on this as your source of truth for this module so yeah having those sorts of things is is really useful yeah i agree with you totally comments from suchi sue yeah, in our case, we manage the release process internally, but uh, I think it's pretty much the same case for us as we do the weekly release meetings internally, partnering with our business. Uh, there are some items the teams uh, identify which they think they need additional information. As you see in the release summary, you don't get to see all the details, but if there is any interesting feature the team is very much interested in implementing the team identifies those things and takes it up with rising as needed and in which case the rising team uh, guides our hubble internal team in terms of execution and it's not just the actual release timing but even when we are doing the annual compensation planning projects uh, with mm -hmm. rising or any other recruiting enhancements uh, we've been doing country-specific projects as well as we have enabling new uh, functionality. So whenever we do these kind of projects, it's very common thing for the implementing consultant from Rising to tell us, well, this is going to be, uh, you know, this is going, this feature would be retired in the next, after the next couple of releases. Do you want to wait and uh, possibly implement the new feature? Uh, and that kind of uh, information is always shared with us based on which we make the decisions. One such recent thing being the onboarding 1.0 versus 2.0, which we have mm -hmm. always been interested in implementing. So there we have been partnering very closely with Rising and looking at the upcoming uh, uh, features and the progress that's being made in the onboarding 2.0, for example, in partnership with Rising. Sue, anything that you want to add? Yeah, I think yeah, everyone covered it. We do use them for our release um, reviews. And again, yeah, it's, it's customized to the organization. I think um, one, it's like, what's the force stuff that's coming that is going to affect us today? And then as we're going through the cycles, like Suchi said, like what's new, what, what can we improve on for that cycle? Um, and then the ones that aren't cyclical, like what is what are we struggling with from a process perspective and what's in there that we maybe haven't thought of yet? Um, so that consultative best practice side of it. So in, in your contracts with Rising, do you have specific services that Rising will perform? So in other words, if you decided to um, work, uh, you know, grab an enhancement from a release that's coming up, would that be part of your contract? Or would that be a new SLA or a new agreement that you'd have to make to, to do that? Yeah, for us, it's um, 
those items are part of the contract, right? Like as we're keeping up with that, there is um, some things depending on on how big they are. Um, and just using like Suchi's example for onboarding, right? Like if we were to go implement, yeah, onboarding 2.0, that's a, a whole big implementation, right? So you're looking at a separate contract for that. Um, in our case, like it's not part of our AMS statement of work. They will help consult with us to understand what it is, but um, to do the actual implementation, it's separate. Okay. And the same goes for us as well, because we have a separate AMS statement of work uh, with which we manage all the regular day-to-day -day support and any enhancements. But if there is any specific requirement, you know, that goes beyond a threshold number of hours and where it makes sense to have a dedicated project manager manage that work, we go with a separate statement of work, onboarding 2.0 being one example. And we have recently rolled out a uh, you know, recruitment project for Mexico country where it made sense to have a uh, you know, dedicated project manager. So those kind of cases we do manage separate with uh, a dedicated PM while we have the business as usual support going on with the regular AMS statement of work. Okay. We've just come off a year and a half or 18 months of a whole lot of unexpected. Um, I, I don't know how many of you were using AMS services during those last 18 months, but how do you manage the unexpected? I can probably take a stab at this. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's very relevant to the times we are in in the last 18 months. And uh, as much as we are in these unusual times, the expectations you have from the users doesn't change much. They do expect to continue to receive that positive experience from the system standpoint. The service has to continue and the customer service is expected to improve as we go. Um, and you know, in managing that kind of challenging expectations, I would say definitely having supplemental support we are getting from our AMS partner in this case, Rising, is very helpful because in our situation, we do annual, we do review annual HR technology roadmaps where we identify all the initiatives we have planned out for the next year. And that roadmap keeps, in, you know, evolving. And we do share our roadmap with Rising. These are all the 20 initiatives we have uh, in the upcoming year. And of these probably, you know, these 12 or 15, we do need Rising support. We go with effort <coughs> estimations and that way Rising can also plan for resources uh, ahead of time for us. And uh, one improvement I have seen for us is, you know, the last couple of years, we have really started, uh, you know, a, you can call it, you know, as an optimization initiative because it's been uh, having used the success factor system for over uh, one and a half to two years. The company feels that the users feel, well, we understand the gaps in the system now. So these are all the 20, 30 improvements we want to see in success factor. So we get a series of uh, list of, uh, you know, usual wish, wish list. Uh, as you may call it. Mm -hmm. And so I get this long bucket list from people. But, uh, you know, in such case, at the same time, you cannot keep that backlog growing up. So we need to balance the business as usual, while also meeting these expectations uh, from users that these are the enhancements or improvements we want to see in the system. In that case, uh, having this partnership with Rising has really helped. And we do a weekly rollout of our enhancements and improvements and success factors. Uh, you know, uh, and if you see us over the period of last 18 months, I would say we have rolled out quite a bit of enhancements and improvements to the success factor system, which is a win for us. And this partnership has played a very good role. And it, it's, it's very interesting and uh, for us, in, in some cases, it's very common for our business partners saying, well, you know, they kind of treat these rising consultants as part of the team. And you say our recruiting business partner saying, well, we want this person. We, I mean, why can't we just get him on the call? <laughs> That's Those are the kind of uh, comments you keep hearing because they really treat them as part of the team. It's not like, well, we open a ticket, let's... Uh, 
you know, get a resource. Yes, that's the process. But as you grow the relationship over a period of time, currently our business partners can name the consultants from rising saying, well, if it is an easy problem, let's call this prop person. If it is recruiting, let's call this consultant. He knows our system in and out. Let's let's ask his opinion. So that's how the relationship has been growing and has impacted us positively. Very nice. Christian, um, do you still want to do it all yourself? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not massively so. It's kind of about necessity more than anything. Um, so I'm kind of a bit useless for this question in that as soon as coronavirus came about, I was furloughed <laughs> in uh, April 2020 um, and then picked up by uh, Huntsworth in December. And I actually owe, um, I owe uh, Joanna, who's in, who I think is still in the chat. She was earlier, Joanna Murphy. Uh, she, she, she actually put me forward for my job uh, interview for Huntsworth because they said, hey, we really need someone who's got success factors experience and has done these modules. And I knew Joanna from, from Dufree. And so we have this sort of consistency of I've worked with the same consultants at Dufree and Huntsworth, even though Huntsworth is US based, Dufree was Switzerland based. And so I had this working relationship already sort of stored up. So as far as I understand it, the, the time, the coronavirus times for, for Huntsworth weren't too different. I think they were very quick to adapt to working from home and everything. Um, and the project only really began, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Joanna, I think like June, July last year. So we're already pretty well into the times we're in now um, at that point. So, yeah, but from a perspective of, of, of how AMS would have helped during that time, I have no doubt that, and I'm sure Dufree is still using it now. It's, yeah, it's your, it's your backbone for when things are uncertain. Sue, we're going to yeah. jump over to you. Yeah, I think, um, so we went live right in the middle, right as um, the pandemic was hitting. Um, we delayed our go live because of it. We were not on rising. We were still, you know, under our implementation partner at that time. I think the bigger unexpected piece that that gets managed is um, turnover in the organization, right? Um, or if somebody's out sick, because internally you may have your subject matter experts, say in recruiting or EC, but the rest of the team is kind of just a, a standard knowledge across the board, right? They're not that expert, um, okay. but it allows the team to still be able to reach out to rising um, and, and learn from them or work with them to solve the problem that we don't have the internal subject matter expert available at the time. Right. Andreas, what, what have your experiences been? Yeah, I mean, it, I can just uh, say basically the same. So it was during the pandemic, it was very helpful to have that as a backbone or as a like a backup for our team in uh, cause of uh, unavailability of our team members. And I think we were in the good position that when the pandemic hit us, we, we had the majority of our implementations already done. So if I would think back in a SAP environment, like an on-premise environment, uh, working remote, uh, it would be a completely different uh, situation. And we did even do two module implementations during uh, the pandemic, uh, completely remote, and even that worked well. So it's not because we always thought you need to have like people directly, uh, like in a location together to have a successful uh, implementation, but we learned it's not needed. I mean, it's maybe easier and it's more convenient, but it's possible even completely remote. Yeah, our entire, oh, sorry. No, no, that's say, Our entire implementation has been remote. So obviously it started mid uh, coronavirus and yeah, I've never even seen the Huntsworth office. <laughs> <I'm> still, <laughs> still working on the projects, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. We, We've just been able to carry on as if nothing changed, which is nice. Very nice. I think it's one of the benefits of cloud as well. Um, what would you say someone should look for in an AMS provider? Just pick up where you left off, Christian. Go ahead. What, what would you advise someone? Uh, flexibility it would be my first thing because the amount of times we have to be flexible and you guys are able to be flexible for us is, 
yeah we owe you a little bit <laughs> um yeah flexibility at patience i think that's one thing that we've found rising and providing abundance is hey we may take a year and a half to make a decision but we want to make the decision correctly and knowing that rising is understanding of that and that we're looking for best practice we're trying to do things the right way the first time um and that is really good to know that that support is waiting for us to do that rather than pushing us to just make a decision i think you have to look at the makeup of your organization and find a partner that has a similar makeup too right um being in 25 different countries, right? You wanna make sure that there's that global experience as well. So that when you're looking at best practices, you're not thinking about it from one country perspective, you're thinking about it globally. Andreas? Yeah, I, I mean, I can just add to, to Sue, that's a very important uh, aspect as we have really a true global setup of our system. And uh, it's I, I see that from other consultants that they have a clear focus like on a country or on a, a region, a regional process and uh, rising teams really also spread uh, around the world and they do implementations and also support for uh, companies which have a global footprint. And I think that helps really a lot that this like basic understanding of different regions, different languages, different currencies uh, is really there. Nice. Sushi? I would um, advise to start looking at the internal team structure, how it's currently laid out, the gaps you have in your support structure. What are the possible things uh, your team might need support you know, down the line in the next two to three years? And uh, if you have all the adequate resourcing, and once you identify the gaps, that's one area where you can probably identify, you know, these are all the gaps I have internally, and these are all the services, which I think would be helpful if we can have someone complement these, um, you know, services for us. And yeah, on top of that, you know, uh, also the internal skill set, sometimes you may have resourcing, but you also need to look at the skill set. Uh, it's, it's always helpful to have an external partner uh, at which level you want to engage is really depending on your company and the you know the business requirement, the volume of requirements you get, um, and all that. But at some point, whether whatever level you want to engage, it's always good to have an experienced partner readily available for you to provide you with the support. And third thing being obviously the geographical. Um, you know, structure you have. Your company is a global company, but again, are, are you based, are you headquartered in US? Where does your tech operations really reside? And is the partner able to provide those services, you know, making sure that it caters to all the requirements you have and as well the resourcing and time zones. And the fourth, the topmost being the flexibility, because I mean, it's, it's very common when you have a partnership that you know, you need flexibility on both sides. It's not just the partner, but it's also from the company perspective, we need to build that mutual trust and partnership. So you need someone who is able to understand and as well be flexible to your company's needs, because I mean, especially in the times we are in, everything is unpredictable, it's uncertain, and flexibility is the topmost criteria. And I think that's something, you know, these are the four things that really helped us with our partnership with Rising and, uh, you know, especially skill set for us is very important because having that experienced consultant who can guide, because from a maturity perspective, uh, prior to being in Hubble, uh, you know, I partnered with Rising with my, when I was with my earlier company, I was with Energizer. Um, and after that, it was uh, the personal care division of Energizer got spun off to Edgewell, and then my partnership with Rising continued there. <laughs> but uh, and now I'm with Hubble. The partnership with Rising still is continuing with our AMS. But the one consistent aspect I have seen, which it kind of stands uh, apart, is the quality and the skill set of the consultants yeah. because. When your organization is, you know, a bit of uh, ahead in terms of the maturity levels of using the system, uh, it's very important you have experienced consultant that can 
drive the conversations, lead the conversations, understanding the maturity level your organization is in. And that's what I think uh, you know makes this partnership work very well for us. And I think just uh, I think the geography point is really interesting because I'm not going to say that they chose me because I was UK, but the entire rest of my team is US based. Um, and so I came in UK and, and pointed out that Ireland wasn't part of the UK and we probably shouldn't have that. In the system. <laughs> um, and that could cause some problems. That's, that's been known to cause problems. Um, so just having, so for example, they, 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 I came in to give a, here's a UK EU perspective on what you've done so far, but also our consultants tend to be UK based and AMS is US and India based. So we have this 24 hour support line with just me being in the UK and the rest of the team being in the US and that we always have someone who can pick up a ticket or always have someone who can raise a ticket at any time and it's covered. So yeah, it, it really helps having that sort of spread geographically. Yeah, I think that's a huge benefit. Uh, anything else anyone wants to add before we wrap up here? I think, you know, I've heard some great things from you that mm -hmm. um, really redefined what application management services is from my perspective, uh, a trusted advisor or someone who help is, helps you with business as usual, who helps you grow and enhance your platform and your services and really um, an extra knowledge worker for your staff. Um, anything from the rest of you before we close up? Andreas? I think, yeah, so when it comes to scalability uh, of the AMS support is what I sensed or what I realized when, when we went live with our solution and we had no knowledge in-house, there were many tickets with really uh, small things, really how-to questions and stuff like that. But with the maturity of the team and the, the gain of knowledge, the number of tickets decreased, but the complexity of the tickets increased. So at the end, we might consume the same or even more hours, but on less tickets, because the tickets uh, which go to Rising are really the things where the, the internal team is out of knowledge. But the easy things and the basic administration tasks, there is no help needed anymore. And you need a partner who can scale with that, like, I would say, uh, growing of the internal de uh, support team. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it adds on the, t the talent piece of it, right? Like the, the what you have internally for your talent, I think we've all said it, right? Like you're, where are the gaps and how does it get supplemented through um, through the AMS support and, and it truly is a partnership. Yeah, I think actually that's it's a, it just made me think of something that I hadn't considered before, which is having AMS as our backup and ha having knowing that there are multiple people at, at Rising who are specialists in every single module has actually expanded our candidate pool for new hires for HRIS positions in that we don't need someone to be the best compensation analyst that there is. They can be more of a journalist because we will always have that specialist backup if we absolutely need it. Obviously, we're not going to lower our, our expectation on the quality of candidates, but it does expand right. our pool from being, you have to find a compensation specialist to, hey, we can find a generalist in success factor who's got years of experience because we know we have that backup and we can train that in-house if we have to. That's using AMS. Yeah, it is an interesting point. And one thing I'd like to share is in terms of upskilling the internal staffing, because as much as we have this AMS partner, one other uh, thing, you know, we as managers uh, or leaders are expected is to make sure your internal staffing is upskilled as well to be able to support. And that's something this partnership also serves. So it's it's not just outsourcing, it's about that partnership, because as we have this partnership with Rising over the years, uh, you know, as whatever work we give for Rising, it depends on the bandwidth of our internal staffing. Sometimes the Hubble internal staff partners with Rising and do the config together. And, mm -hmm. uh, and also in sometimes there is a training aspect. So over a period of time, it's not that you are losing any kind of thing, but what you are really doing here is uh, you are upskilling your internal staffing while also providing the business with the required support timely here, which is uh, which is a good thing. 
Well, thank you all. This has been really, honestly, a stimulating discussion. It's been fun meeting all of you and listening to your stories. Uh, I think we're at, almost at the end of this hour, so I'm going to wrap it up and um, thank you again. And those of you who are watching this on replay, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us and we'll put you in touch with the right person.